This is where we settled in. It's an old furniture store. It used to be Andor's Furniture. The nice thing about this location though is that we were able to take uh, all of the things that we had learned at the old place and apply that here. We had a, basically a blank slate. Was everything from the walls in had to be redone here, torn out and redone. One of the things that we wanted to make sure of is that in this space, we wanted to maintain and actually increase our commitment to gallery space. This space, everything's handicapped accessible. I built these flexible walls. They're all on wheels, so everything can be moved around depending on different types of events, shows, whether it's sculpture or two-dimensional art. We can deal with as much as we possibly can in here. We still have one show that changes. These are generally local artists, although the artist that's up now is from Pennsylvania. Those change about every month, month and a half, and that's in the, the front of the gallery. And then in the back is sort of our stable of artists that, that we've been selling for years. Um, for instance, Gate Huntington, Mark Friedman, Nadia Mafuse, we, we, uh, and a lot of others that have that we've uh, attracted. But the commitment's the same. Community outreach, give grassroots artists a chance. We try and get several in a year, new artists that perhaps this is their first show. And then of course we mix that in with artists that, that show regularly. Things that we focus on here is, you know, obviously the number one thing is to do no harm for the artwork, create the best design possible at the best price we, we can. And a lot goes into that. But one of the things we try and do is apply technology not for the sake of applying technology, but applying it where it makes sense. This is an example of applying technology where it makes sense. It's a, a computer-aided design mat cutter. This is one of those things where technology just blew away the tried and true manual method. This is so much more accurate. The corners are perfect. You can design just about anything, curves, multi-layered mats, all sorts of multi-opening mats. This will, will blast them out. You still, it's not as simple as pushing a button though. You still need to really, really know what you're doing on it. It takes years to get the most out of these machines uh, as an operator. But this is, the, this is the way you want to be cutting the insides of mats. And when I say apply technology where necessary, this example is a, one of our original paper cutters from the turn of the century. It is still, uh, and I mean the last century, <laughs> this is still the best way to cut the outside of a mat. It's a big, heavy blade that we have sharpened uh, once or twice a year, depending on use, and that's still the best way to do it. The other thing is hinging. We were discussing earlier about things that artists should know when treating their artwork, specifically, you know, when they come to the, the frame store or whether they're gonna frame it themselves. and. Really, the very first thing to consider is how you're going to attach that artwork to whatever substrate it's going to be displayed on. Because you're not just putting art in an empty frame, it needs to be attached to some sort of rigid backing board. And there are a lot of ways to do that. There's tapes, there's glues, you could sew things down depending on what your me uh, media type was that you used in creating the artwork. But we prefer hinging. Again, we want 100 years from now, 200 years from now, a uh, conservator to be able to undo anything we did in framing and look like it had never been framed at all. That's, that's essentially our goal. So when it comes to hinging, there you can use lots of tapes. And if there's one thing I could get through to artists, uh, especially newer artists, the experienced ones already know this, particularly with works on paper, you want to properly hinge. I've seen masking tape, I've seen scotch tape, I've even seen duct tape for attaching art. You don't know what's in those chemicals. More than likely, if it's commercially available for residential consumer use, it's going to be awful for your artwork in general. Uh, so you at least want to be using acid-free tapes, acid-free hinges that are designed for artists. However, even those, even though they're acid-free and they will hinge your work correctly, getting those hinges off, say the artwork was damaged in shipping or, or a move or something like that, or was in a bad environment and the adhesive releases on one but not another, to get that, that tape off of the artwork very often involves the work of a paper conservator. And they're extremely good at what they do. Uh, it's an apprentice-type uh, career. People spend their lives perfecting that craft. And as a consequence, it's, it is as a consequence, it is expensive to have them work on your piece. So to remove an acid-free piece of tape, even though there'll be no damage from the acid, you're going to be into a lot of money to have these things professionally removed. So like the machine here from the the 1800s and early 19, best method of hinging is tried and true couple thousand years old Japanese method of using mulberry hinges. We'll do an example of that, but there's a couple of things. We're using uh, rice starch or wheat starch. We, do, we use rice now. We cook that ourselves. It's organic. It will go badly. So unless you're using this on a regular basis, it, it's not cost effective. Fortunately, we do enough of it here where we're, we're running through batches all the time. 
The nice thing about this is that you're using a starch that adheres to the artwork and the paper. This is a lot of starch in the paper itself. It forms a bond. It is completely acid free, but the best part is a drop or two of distilled water and it releases. It reactivates the starch, it releases from the paper, anyone can do this at home. It just takes a little bit of skill. There are some pre-mixed starches that you can get from suppliers like University Products. The other thing to consider, particularly if it's a higher value piece of work, is the type of hinge. We use a mulberry fibrous tissue. We use different weights of that depending on the weight of the paper because you want the hinge to be slightly less in weight and I mean the point at which from a tensile strength it, it will snap. You want it to be less strong than the paper it's being attached to because again, the scenario of a move that's gone wrong and a piece is dropped, whether it's in a crate or not, that's a lot of force between the artwork and the substrate it's attached to. So you want that middle part to fail rather than hang on to the artwork and tear the artwork. So that's one of the qualities and one of the, the advantages of doing that is you can really dial it in for exactly your, your specific need. This is the rice starch paste. I use rice now instead of wheat. I think it shrinks less. Easier to remove, sturdy at the same time. So I'm just going to put some of this paste in my hinge on the edge. And you got the little hairs hanging out because that makes it easier to grab and remove whenever you have to. This is um, Kozo. I love it. It's, it's beautiful paper. So it's, it's attached on the back right now. And I have a layer of uh, blotter paper and polyester, which nothing will stick to. So that goes under there so that this hinge, whatever paste is on it, won't stick to the back of the board. And then I put another piece of polyester and another blotter board on, paper on. And then I just want to make sure I know where the hinge is. Put the weight. I'll let that set for about 15 minutes. And then I'm just gonna go ahead and fast forward and show you the rest. So say that's attached or dried. And the next part is to flip that over. A little more paste. Onto the board. And I just smooth it out so it's nice and smooth. You almost can't see it once it's on there. Another piece of polyester blotter paper and um, let it set until it's dry. Station, which is like a moth to the flame for artists here. It's a, it's a little section of our back shop, but it's a very important one. This is where when frames are, are cut and joined, uh, very often that's the end of the story. They're cut, joined, the art's put in and out the door it goes. Here every frame is inspected and uh, to look for any flaws or gaps in the uh, in the corners or the joinery of the frame. This one's extremely clean, but we're still gonna find little gaps when we look at these and fill them, though they are super, super tight. This is length molding for the most part. It is cut and then joined, so of course there's going to be a seam. So we try everything we can to make that seam be as invisible as possible to the viewer so it's not distracting the, the viewer from the artwork. So glazing became more important because uh, incandescent light bulbs weren't as bad and with the, with the advent of compact fluorescence, it got worse. So uh, TrueView is probably the industry leader in, in glazing that deals with this issue. There are a couple of others, but these are definitely, this is the front running company and they have several products. So uh, this would be standard clear glass this would be something called UltraView, and I'll get into that in a minute. But you can see the difference, and that's another issue. So it might not be just UV. For instance, this UltraView does not um, filter 99% uh, of the UV, such as these other two products over here. Uh, however, if you are in a modern home with modern lighting and LED, um, and it's not in direct sunlight, this could be a good option for you because it is certainly better looking uh, from a clarity perspective than standard glass. Um, but if you're already in an environment that doesn't have a UV component to it, I think it's the best glass there is, and it's a less expensive than these guys. Certainly more than regular glass, but a lot less expensive than the UV filtering ones. So that's the first sort of cheat, and that's a new product. Uh, so now that lighting is, is getting better, if you know your environment is safe from a UV perspective, I'd go with that. However, if you are in an area where there's sunlight is an issue and UV is an issue, uh, you need to go into something like these two products. This is a, called a Conservation Clear. Both of these protect the exact same way. They protect 99%, they block 99% of the UV light. The difference here again between these two is, is clarity. So there is an anti-reflective coating in, in the UltraView glass and in the museum glass there is both an anti-reflective coating 
and a 99% blocking of UV light. So that's the advantage here. These two, again, if reflection is not an issue, you can, you can solve this with proper lighting too. If your lighting is such that it just doesn't create any reflections, you can save a lot of money and go to this guy, which you know has the same protective quality as this. The next thing is getting into acrylics. This is a standard acrylic. The, re the reason there's a feather in here is to demonstrate the anti-static nature of this product. So even though this is called museum glass, museums actually use this, the uh, lack of breakage concern. Now, you know, this is glass, it can shatter. This is, this takes a lot to shatter this. However, this is by far the most expensive product out here. Problem with acrylic holds a, an electric charge very well. And when you have it is uh, particulate based, so charcoal, pastels, for instance, if you are beyond the size, and that's the other thing, acrylic can go very large, much larger than the sizes offered by, by standard glass. So if you have a very large acrylic, and I mean large as in larger than 40 by 60 inches, then you have to go into this product because they just don't make these in those sizes. Your framing costs could be up there to do it, to do it correctly where you have a solution that will both glaze it and not pull the particulate off the paper, which is uh, what these would do if you were to wipe them down. So that is essentially the, the 50 cent tour of glazing today. I always recommend, you know, you don't have to come to Providence Picture Frame for framing, but I would definitely recommend going to an owner operated frame shop of your choice because they're more invested in maintaining a relationship with the person.